Please open your Bibles to Luke's Gospel, the 24th chapter. You'll find the notes in the bulletin. Um, And if you don't have a Bible, you'll find this morning's text on the back of the notes. This morning, we will look at the very last paragraph in Luke's Gospel. Have no fear, there's still two or three messages to go as we wrap up Luke. But we come to the end of Luke's text. Uh, I believe this is our 140th message in Luke. Um, If you think that's long, though, my old pastor, John MacArthur, took 10 years to get through this. So I'm I'm going lickety-split. Have no fear. And this is a passage on the ascension, um, and it's something I think that is frequently a footnote receives very little actual attention. I know that when I first sort of came to this text, my initial thought was, how am I going to fill up a message? And as I studied it more and more, I thought, man, how am I going to communicate all of this, especially on a communion Sunday? So I hope you will um, bear with me. I think there's a lot for us to see here in the ascension. I'd like to begin by reading uh, Luke 24, 50 to 53. Then he led them out as far as Bethany... And lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. They worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And were continually in the temple, blessing God. Oh Lord God, as we study this last paragraph in the Gospel of Luke, as we consider the ascension of our Lord to glory to your right hand. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Help us to see the glories of the risen Christ. May our response be similar to the disciples. Joy, rejoicing, blessing others, blessing your name. It's in Christ's name that we ask this. Amen. So as we consider this paragraph, these four verses, I want to look at it along three lines. The first, we'll look at Luke's description of the ascension. Then we'll pay some attention to the response of the disciples. And then finally, um, briefly considering four significance, what the so what of the ascension. The ascension is so important in Luke's account that he actually tells it twice. Here at the end of Luke's gospel and then at the beginning of the book of Acts. Um, It's an important reality. In one sense, it's the culmination of our Lord's work. So let's begin first by setting the context. Where, where, when are we? Now, if you read Luke straight through chapter 24, you might think this is all the night of the resurrection. Um, There has been a tight chronology starting at the beginning of chapter 24. If you look there, the first day of the week. So we're dealing with Sunday. The women go to the tomb at dawn. They come back. They give the report to the disciples. They go out and check. There's no angel that they see. That same day, verse 13, two men are going to a village named Emmaus. The same day now. So we're still on that resurrection Sunday. And the Lord accompanies them. They sit down for a meal that evening. And he uh, is seen to them. They, They recognize him. He disappears. And then we're told that same hour. Verse 33, they rose that same hour. So we're still Resurrection Sunday night. Now, depending on how long it took them to travel at night, the uh, seven miles or so, this is either very late Resurrection Sunday night or very early Monday morning. And then they gather together, and the most natural reading is our Lord appears to them, and he eats in front of them, and he lets them touch him. But what the ESV starts in verse 44 is then he said to them. The Greek is simply and he said to them. In other words, there's this opportunity for much time to occur both there and in verse 50. Now, the reason I say that is if you turn to Acts chapter 1, Luke gives some more information. The blank here is when 40 days later. 40 days later. Acts chapter 1. And keep your finger here. We'll look at a couple passages here over the next few points. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up. 
After he had given commands to the Holy Spirit, to the apostles whom he had chosen, he presented himself alive to them after his resurrection, after his suffering, by many proofs, appearing to them 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. So Luke knows there's a 40-day period that occurs in here. In fact, um, the verse where it says Jesus opened their minds to understand the scriptures back in Luke, verse 45, may refer to the 40 days of instruction in part. It may not simply be a supernatural work opening their minds. It could be a both and where their minds are opened and Jesus is teaching them. So that's the when, 40 days later. Who? And the blank here is as many as 120 people. Possibly as few as 11. More likely, 120. Where do I get that from? Keep reading in Acts. Verse 6, pick it up there. Chapter 1, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They're still looking for the messianic kingdom after 40 days of instruction by the risen Lord. He had not converted them to amillennialism yet. One laugh, two laughs. Okay, great. Um, in other words, they're still expecting a kingdom. And our Lord doesn't say, no, there's no kingdom. He says, it's not for you to know. But what, what is there? What is their purview? What should they be focused on? Verse 8, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. When he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. While they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who is taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Now keep reading. Then they, this is all the people who saw that, returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew and Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. So this group who returned is bigger than the 11, but keep going, just a few verses further. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of the persons was in all about 120. And said, brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in the ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness. Falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his bowels gushed out and became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So the field was called in their language, Akeldama, which is the field of blood. For it is written in the book of the Psalms, may his camp become desolate, and let there be no one to dwell in it, and let another take his office. So one of the men who had accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning with his baptism of John, until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to the resurrection. So Peter's addressing 120 people and saying, one of us who's been here from start to end, the start being the baptism of John, the end, the ascension. So he's speaking to 120 people, I think, who witnessed the ascension. So back to Luke. That's setting the context, the when, 40 days later. Who? I think we got a group with maybe even more than 120 because Peter's... You could read it just speaking to the potential candidates to replace Judas, not including the women, not including others. Um, The simple point being, I I do believe this is more than the 11, where he led them out as far as Bethany. Now, Bethany is located on the Mount of Olives. Um, This is mentioned in Luke as Jesus was approaching Jerusalem um, in verse... um, 1929, when they drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet. That's when he sent the disciples for for the donkey that no one had ridden on, the colt of a donkey. So that's the location. So Jesus is in charge. He has brought them to full faith. He's opened their mind. He's instructed them. And so what we're going to see the disciples doing here is, is the right thing. They're not bumbling anymore. They get it now. Their eyes are opened. Their minds are instructed 
And the Lord leads them out, out from Jerusalem, out potentially from where you're staying in Bethany. He leads them out as far as Bethany. And there, what happens? Two things really happen. The first, lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And the second, while he blessed them, he was parted from them. And I want to move a little more slowly here at this point. Why, what is the significance of Jesus lifting up his hands either to heaven or to them? I can't be certain. Blessing them. Blessing them. I think it's very significant. In fact, this is probably the single point that unpacks the most that I hadn't expected to be there. And I want to suggest two things that are significant of Jesus blessing his disciples in this way. One, the first, number one. This is very similar to what Moses did before leaving his people. And the reason I make that point is that one of the titles of Christ that has been echoing in Luke's gospel from chapter 7 is, this is the great prophet like Moses. Remember the book of Deuteronomy, God promised, I will raise up from among your brothers a prophet like Moses. It is to him that you shall listen And starting in chapter 7, the people say, a great prophet has risen up among us. And Jesus goes up on the Mount of Transfiguration, and he speaks with Moses and Elijah, two of the greatest Old Testament prophets. They speak to him about the exodus he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. And God the Father, in confirming this is that prophet, says, this is my beloved son, my servant, listen to him. So Luke has made it clear to the reader, Jesus is the greater prophet like Moses. And so it's fitting that just as Jesus has a a birth announcement, um, we we looked at that when we were back in chapter 2 and 1, how Jesus' birth and the circumstances around are similar to other prophets, remember, like Hannah, Samuel's mother. And so there's, there's a peculiar birth around John the Baptist and, and a virgin birth for Jesus. In Deuteronomy 33, verse 1, we read this. This is the blessing with which Moses blessed, which Moses, the man of God, blessed the people of Israel before his death. And then you can read the entire chapter as Moses blessing over his people. Jacob did something similar at the end of his life, blessing his sons. And so here Jesus is like Moses. Now Moses blessed the people, and then he went up away from them, up on the mountain, and he died. And he died for his own sin. But in a similar fashion, Jesus is about to depart from his people. He is their great prophet, and he blesses them in a similar way before he is taken up and away from them. So that's, I think, the first significance. It gives closure and solemnity, and it's one final stamp in the prophetic mold. Start to finish, Jesus is a great prophet. He's more than a great prophet, but he is a great prophet. And just as Moses blessed the people before he departed from them, So Jesus does the same. But there's actually a stronger connection taking place. Um, I was surprised at this. What I was surprised at was there really are no biblical references other than one to someone raising their hands and blessing people. And that surprised me. I thought that'd be all over the place. There's, There's one. There's one antecedent reference that I was able to find. And that is Leviticus 9. If you turn back there. Leviticus 9. Your second blank is this. Just as Aaron did coming down from the altar. So the only place I could find in the Bible where a person lifted their hands and blessed people is right here in Leviticus chapter 9. We're going to spend a few minutes here looking at this. So it's verse 22 of Leviticus chapter 9. We read, then Aaron lifted up his hands towards the people and blessed them. Now Luke is very aware of the Old Testament. And so Jesus lifting up his hands and blessing the disciples has got to ring in the ears of people who know their Old Testaments. And I think he wants us to make this connection. But there's more of a connection going on than simply this, because we've got to set this passage in Leviticus in its context. What's going on? Turn back to chapter 8 of Leviticus. In Leviticus chapter 8, what we find is Moses has gone up onto the mountain and God has given him a pattern and a code for the worship of Israel and the tabernacle. And part of that code is for the priesthood. And Aaron is singled out and his sons are singled out to become priests. 
And here in chapter 8, Aaron and his sons are consecrated for the priesthood. The entire chapter is devoted to this formal, public consecration and commissioning of Aaron and his sons to the priesthood. Look at uh, verse 1 of chapter 8. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take Aaron and his sons with him, and the garments, and the anointing oil, and the bull of the sin offering, and the two rams, and the basket of unleavened bread, and assemble all the congregation at the entrance of the tent of meetings. This is a public event. This is a public installment, a public commissioning. And he is publicly anointed. In verse 6, they wash him with water. In verse 7, he's given a coat and a robe, an ephod. Verse 8, a breastpiece and an urim and a thumen and a turban. And in verse 9, a crown. And then the rest of the chapter is devoted to all of the sacrifices Aaron has to make to atone and deal with his sin. Because the logic is if he's going to draw near to God, he needs to be really, 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 really super special clean. Because God's holy. In fact, what comes after chapter 9 is chapter 10, where Nadab and Abihu offer strange fire, and they're burnt to a crisp, reinforcing the point. You don't fool around with God. Take him seriously. And so Aaron gives these offerings, and it ends, chapter 8, look at verse 30. Then Moses took some of the anointing oil, the blood that was on the altar, sprinkled it on Aaron and his garments, and also on his sons and his sons' garments. So he consecrated Aaron and his garments, and his sons, and his sons' garments with him. But we're still not done. There's a public ceremony, but God is so holy that if Aaron and his sons are going to serve as priests in the very holy place, ministering before the Lord, look down at verse um, 34. As it, I'll pick it up. I'll just keep reading in 31. Moses said to Aaron and his sons, Boil the flesh at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And there eat it, and the bread that is in the basket of the ordination offering, as I commanded, saying, Aaron and his son shall eat it. And what remains of the flesh and the bread you shall burn up with fire, and you shall not go outside the entrance of the tent of meeting for seven days, until the days of your ordination are complete. For it will take seven days to ordain you, as has been done today. The Lord has commanded to be done to make atonement for you. At the entrance of the tent of meeting, you shall remain day and night for seven days, performing what the Lord has charged so that you do not die. For so I have been commanded. That point is going to be reinforced, like I said, when his sons play fast and loose with the priesthood in chapter 10. Now look how chapter 9 begins on the eighth day. So we've just had a public ordination ceremony for Aaron and his sons, a week-long consecration, further ordaining. And now that's done. Aaron comes forward. On the eighth day, Moses called Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel. This is no longer a public, big public event. It will become one shortly. And Aaron's still not done offering sacrifices for himself. Again, the point's being driven home. God is holy. We are sinful. Even this priest, even this man has been washed and dipped and sprinkled and consecrated and spent a week serving. That He's still unclean. Moses called Aaron and the sons and the elders of Israel, and he said to Aaron, Take for yourself a bull calf for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering, both without blemish, and offer them before the Lord, and say to the people of Israel, Take a male goat for a sin offering and a calf half and a lamb, both a year old and blemish for a burnt offering, and an ox and a ram for a peace offering, a sacrifice before the Lord. And then skip down to verse 7. Moses said to Aaron, draw near to the altar and offer your sin offering and your burnt offering and make atonement for yourself and for the people. And that's what we're going to see Aaron do. Verse 8, Aaron drew near to the altar, killed the calf of the sin offering, which was for himself. Verse 12, he killed the burnt offering. And then finally, after an initial ceremony, a week-long consecration, more sin offerings for himself. Now, finally, in verse 15, and for the first time under this priesthood, then he presented the people's offering and took the goat of the sin offering that was for the people. In other words, he's now just beginning to function as a priest. Because remember... Making it really simple, a prophet stands in between God and people, talking to people for God. This is what the Lord has said, right? And a priest does a bunch of things, but it's helpful to think he stands in between God and men, talking to God for the people, making sacrifices for the people, interceding for the people. It's more complex than that, but that's a 
simple enough way to wrap your hands around what the difference between a prophet and a priest is. And so after all of this purifying and consecrating, only now does he start offering a sacrifice for the people in verse 15. And he presented the bird offering, and down in verse 18, then he killed the ox and the ram and the sacrifice of the peace offering. Which means then, and here's the point I want you to get. When Luke alludes to verse 22, Luke is not just alluding to Aaron's blessing of the people. He is alluding to Aaron's blessing of the people after his first um, formal service as a priest, after he's first been commissioned. As, in other words, he's just received this priesthood. He's just been commissioned. He's just done his first sacrifice of sin for the people. That's what Luke quotes. I think that's significant. Then Aaron lifted up his hands towards the people and blessed them and came down from offering the sin offering and the burnt offering and the peace offerings. Why I think that's significant? Jesus, our Lord, has just made an offering for sin. Jesus, our Lord, has just atoned for the sins of his people. And Jesus, our Lord, we'll see more of this a little later, according to Hebrews, is entering into his high priestly ministry, a ministry of priesthood of the order of Melchizedek. The author of Hebrews has a lot to say about that. But Luke is signaling that here as Jesus, to anyone who's familiar with the Old Testament, unmistakably is acting like Aaron, and not just acting like Aaron, but acting like Aaron when Aaron first received formally his priesthood. I think that's what's going on. Um, just as Aaron did coming down from the altar. And Aaron's blessing of the people was not some innovation on his part. The Lord had actually instructed him how to bless them. Uh, you will hear me frequently close our um, services with this benediction. Listen to Numbers 6, 22 to 27. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons saying, Thus you shall bless the people of Israel. You shall say to them, The Lord bless you. And keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So shall they put my name upon the rest of the people, and I will bless them. So Jesus is functioning like Aaron the high priest. He's acting in that way, he's blessing his disciples. And I think the reason for that, and the reason Luke's highlighting that, is because Jesus is transitioning into his full-time priestly ministry. I mean, there's a sense in which Jesus has functioned as a priest, even throughout Luke's gospel, claiming the temple. Seems to be, in my mind, a priestly act, the cleansing of the leper. But his focused, ordained, commissioned priesthood, we'll see in Hebrews, begins at the ascension. And the act of raising his hands, I want to read a quote, it's both a visible and an audible blessing. Lifting hands in blessing like kneeling in prayer is liturgical body language in which the body enacts what the will resolves and the mouth declares. And Luke's highlighting the act of the blessing. He doesn't tell us what the blessing is. In fact, by telling us that Jesus ascended while he was still blessing them, whether he's still speaking or whether it just means his hands are still raised, highlights the fact that Luke is not concerned particularly with the content. Like, what, what did he say? We don't, we don't know what he said. He blessed them. He was, ble he was blessing them. It's the act of blessing Luke's highlighting, which again makes me think the connection to Leviticus 9 is sound. I want to read a quote from John Calvin on this point. He brings up a really interesting distinction between Jesus blessing his disciples and Aaron or anyone else blessing men. He says this, of Jesus raising his hands to bless them, by which, this is Calvin, by which he showed that the office of blessing, which was enjoined on the priests under the law, belonged truly and properly to him. And here's the neat observation. When men bless one another, it is nothing else than praying in their behalf of them. But with God, it is otherwise. For he does not merely befriend us by wishes, but by a simple act of his will, grants what is desired for us. In other words, priests... <laughs> We're priests. We're a nation of priests. We, we pray for each other. We petition God to be gracious and kind to each other. 
Jesus is just blessing them. Here's the difference. Jesus is God. He's blessing them. <laughs> that's, that's cool. Because this passage ends with the disciples blessing God in the temple. But Jesus first blesses them. And he can do so directly. He can do so directly. And then we're told, secondly, that as he's doing this, he was parted from them. He ascends into heaven. And again, this is in keeping with the prophetic pattern. There was a prophet, Elijah, who was taken up to heaven in a fiery chariot. Enoch walked with God and was not. And so likewise, Jesus doesn't disappear as he did at the meal in Emmaus, but he ascends up into heaven from the Mount of Olives. He was carried into heaven. And this, of course, fulfills his own predictions if you remember in Luke 20, 42, when he was challenging the Sadducees in the temple, he cited Psalm 110, verse 1, which, by the way, is the most commonly cited passage in the New Testament. Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. So in Psalm 110, the Lord says to David's Lord, come here and be exalted. The right hand position is the position of exaltation. And Jesus later applies that unmistakably to himself in 2269. But from now on, you shall see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power of God. So Jesus unmistakably applies Psalm 110 to him. I'm the one who will be told, come sit at my right hand. And the ascension is where that is accomplished. By raising him visibly, by raising him gloriously... It is unmistakable. This is the one in whom the Lord is pleased, his chosen and beloved son. Jesus ascends to glory, to the right hand of the Father. And the other thing Jesus hinted at that he does in being taken up this way is in preparation to send the Spirit, in preparation to send the Spirit. He's already told them in, in chapter 24, just a few verses earlier, verse 49, I am sending the promise of my father upon you. And that assumes he's in a different locale. And, and John's gospel impacts this even more clearly that it's to our advantage that Jesus leaves. So he sends the comforter, he sends the Holy Spirit. So that's the event, the ascension. Let's quickly look at the response of the disciples. We're told four things that they did, and I think they got it right on every point. First, they worshiped him. Now, if you want proof, that the New Testament writers and the disciples believed Jesus was God, and not just a great man, here it is. In Luke's gospel, it's been made crystal clear, you only worship God. I mean, that's, that's made abundantly clear by our Lord himself in Luke 4. The Satan tempts him, right? And says to him, Luke 4, 7, If then you will worship me, it will be yours, all these kingdoms. Jesus answered him, it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only. So out of Jesus' own mouth, you only worship God. And what normally happens in Luke's gospel is Jesus works a miracle. Jesus gives a profound teaching, and we're told people worship and praise God as a result. So when he heals the paralytic on the mat, amazement seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, we have seen something extraordinary today. Or in chapter 7, fear seized them all, and they glorified God. Verse, chapter 13, verse 13. He laid his hands on her. This is the, the dead girl. And immediately, no, the bent woman. And immediately she was made straight and she glorified God. The, the leper who returned in chapter 17, verses 15 through 16, turned back praising God, fell at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. He gave thanks to Jesus. He gave praise to God. Where the blind man immediately recovered his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. So the normal pattern in Luke's gospel, people can thank Jesus, people can marvel at Jesus, but they're praising and glorifying God. Here, they're worshiping Jesus. And that shift is emphatic. Jesus, Luke wants us to understand, is a right object of worship. He is a fitting object of worship, which means, according to Jesus' own standard, he is God. Luke believes so. Jesus, by accepting it, believes so. The apostles believe so. These early disciples believe so. We must believe so as well. 
And sometimes ignorant people will say, where does the Bible teach that Jesus? Here, right here. They worshipped him. They worshipped him. Second, they returned to Jerusalem with great joy. They're obedient. They, they do what he says. And they do so gladly. Before, they were glum and sad and sorrowful. Now they're obeying and they're doing so with great joy. They returned to Jerusalem with great joy. Third, they were continually in the temple. This, by the way, helped set up a lot of the action in the book of Acts. In the early parts of Acts, the early church is located in and around the temple. They're meeting in the temple. Peter was going up to pray at the hour in the temple. Acts 2, 46 And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. And they blessed God. They blessed God. First, they received the blessing from God. And the result of that is this joy, this obedience, and they in turn bless God. Very different meaning of blessed there, by the way. Very different meaning of blessed there. It also um, makes Luke's gospel end in much the same way it began at the beginning of luke's gospel what do you have encounters in the temple as zechariah encounters the angel in the in the holy place or when the baby lord jesus is taken up in the arms of simeon who praises and blesses god chapter one chapter two so luke begins with praise and rejoicing in the temple and it ends the same way now very quickly what are we to make of all this? What are we to make of all this? And I just want to highlight four, four implications, four reasons the ascension of our Lord is significant, four reasons why um, it, is, it is good for us to look at this. First, the significance of the ascension, it enters Jesus into his mediatorial reign. Now, mediatorial may sound like a big word, And it's meant to distinguish Jesus' current reign and rule from his future reign and rule. He is reigning now. He is seated at the right hand of God. He is Lord of Lord, King of Kings, but he is not ruling as he one day will. The author of Hebrews puts it this way in Hebrews 2.8. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he has left nothing outside of his control. He's talking about the exaltation of the Son. At present, we do not see everything in subjection to him. Because at present, the God of this world, our enemy Satan, walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he will destroy. At present, every knee does not bow and every tongue does not confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We know that one day they will. But Jesus' ascension, he ascends to the right hand of the Father. He ascends in fulfillment of Psalm 110.1. He ascends in glorification to enter into his kingly rule. That happens by virtue of the ascension. And that logic is is necessary to understand some of the New Testament's quotations of the Old Testament. So Jesus enters into his mediatorial reign. Um, He's ruling now, not like he will rule with a rod of iron, which is the language that the book of Revelation picks up, linking all the way back to Psalm 2 about Jesus' return. Secondly, it enters Jesus into his priestly ministry. It enters Jesus into his priestly ministry. Turn quickly to Hebrews chapter 7. Um, We're going to have to move quickly here, but I do think it's worth looking at. Luke has hinted at this with his allusion to Leviticus 9. The author of Hebrews will directly unpack it. Chapter 7, starting in verse 20. Of Hebrews. And the whole argument here in this portion of Hebrews is the superiority of Jesus' covenant, of Jesus' sacrifice, and of Jesus' priesthood. Um, That Jesus, what he brings is better than what Moses brought down from the mountain. Verse 20 It's not without an oath for those who formerly became priests or made such without an oath, but this one was made a priest with an oath. And by the one who said to him, and then he cites the oath at Psalm 110, the Lord has sworn, and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently. 
because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since, get this, he always lives to make intercession for them. That's the textual foundation for most of the song before the throne of God above. What what is Jesus doing right now? Interceding as our priest on our behalf in the throne room of God. For it is indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separate from sinners, exalted above the heavens. When was he exalted above the heavens? At the ascension. He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people. And we saw that in Leviticus, just what a long process it was to get Aaron to the point where he could finally begin to offer sacrifices for the people. He had no need, verse 27, like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily for first for his own sins and then for those of the people since he did this once For all when he offered up himself. In one sense, Jesus' priesthood begins on the cross because he is offering himself as a sacrifice. That's something priests do. The law points men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of oath, which came later than the law, points a son who has been made perfect forever. Now, the point in what we're saying is this we have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of majesty in heaven. When was he seated there? At the ascension. A minister in the holy place, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. And then he goes on to describe the priestly ministry. We've got to get back. So the, the, the ascension is where Jesus is enthroned into his kingship, his mediatorial reign. The ascension is when Jesus explicitly enters into his priestly ministry. Third, the ascension fully vindicates Jesus' claims. The resurrection does as well. But but what proof is it that this is a true prophet? This is the true Messiah, This is David's greater son, the ascension, raising him to glory in heaven publicly is one final proof of the father's amening and pleasure in his son. Jesus is vindicated over 120 witnesses. And finally, in doing so this way, it perfectly sets the stage for his return. It perfectly sets the stage for his return. You remember the angel who was seen um, when Jesus ascended in Acts said, why are you standing, staring? He will return just as he came. Final place I'll ask you to turn, our final passage we'll look at, go to Zechariah 14. Jesus' ascension guarantees and makes, perfectly sets the stage for his return, the second coming. He hasn't gone forever. And in Zechariah 14, we read about the Lord's return. Verse 1, Behold, the day is coming for the Lord, when the spoil taken from you will be divided in your midst. For I'll gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle. The city shall be taken, the houses plundered, the women raped, half the city shall go into exile. And if you've read through Zechariah in chapter 12, this is, this is it. This is the final conflagration. This is all the nations gathering around Jerusalem. There's a breach in the walls. It looks as though all hope is lost. People are being taken away. Verse 3. Then the Lord, note the all caps, Yahweh, then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. On that day, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives. This Jesus who you've seen ascend will return in just the same way to just the same spot. What is the touchdown point for the returned Lord? Mount of Olives. So Jesus' ascension from the Mount of Olives is in perfect harmony with Scripture and perfectly prepares the way for his return. And speaking of which, our celebration of the Lord's table, which we're going to turn to now in a moment, is what we do, proclaiming his death and resurrection until he returns. Please pray with me. Lord God, we... We marvel at your goodness and your glory. 
Um, You have given us a savior. You have given us your son. You've given us a sacrifice for sin. You've given us a king. You've given us a priest who serves and pleads on our behalf even now while I am speaking in your presence. The risen, raised, glorified Lord Jesus. Oh Lord God, may we be filled with the joy that the disciples were filled with as they understood this. May we obey as promptly as they did, joyfully. And may the words of our tongue issue out words of blessing to you and to others. In Jesus' name, amen.